Hello, ReaderCon. I'm Matthew Cheney, and this is a reading of an old story. Normally at ReaderCon, I read something new um, and unpublished. In this case, though, to honor our guest of honor, Jeffrey Ford, I've uh, decided to read a story Jeff and I wrote together quite a few years ago and which originally appeared in Electric Velocipede, a zine published and edited by John Klima. This is a story from uh, issue 11, which was published in the fall of 2006. It's a story called Quitting Dreams, and Jeff and I wrote it when he was in the midst of quitting smoking, and he was doing the patch, I think, um, maybe multiple patches at the time, and they were causing uh, lots of weird dreams, very vivid dreams for him, and he was writing these down and posting them to the Nightshade Books message boards, and I thought they were great, and I said to him, Jeff, you should make these into a story. He said, that's a great idea. Why don't you do it for me? And I, being young and naive, thought, sure, I'll, you know, whip out some sort of structure of a story for Jeff and then hand it over to him and he can do what he wants with it. So I started playing around with these dreams as he had written them and building a story around them. And I sent this on to Jeff and he liked it. We did some work on it together, sent it off to various editors, all of whom rejected it. They sent it back to us pretty quickly many places that had never before rejected Jeff Ford were rejecting him now. Uh, and eventually, I think he had some sort of blackmail material on John Klima, and so he convinced John to publish it. And John did, and it came out in Electric Philosophy, which was a wonderful zine, um, and I was happy to appear in there, and even more happy to appear to share a, Jeff, a uh, byline with Jeff Ford. I hadn't read the story in a long time before preparing for this reading, and it is, uh, it's got some fun stuff in it, but it's also over long. Jeff, we, we could have edited this one a little better, uh, but uh, I'm going to read a part of it. You don't have seven hours, so I won't read the whole thing, um, but just I'll read the first beginning parts. Uh, to give you a sense of it. I don't think the story has ever been reprinted before. It, it certainly did not appear in uh, any of Jeff's collections, and so this is something of a, a special opportunity. So this is Quitting Dreams. I met Paul Cleary because I was addicted to his dreams. I wanted to meet the man who had ruined my life. To be more precise, I wanted to meet Paul Cleary so I could kill him. With the last bits of money I had, I hired a detective to sniff out his address. Then I bought a pistol from a kid on the street in, Bo in the Bronx at dusk on July 4th. Fireworks had already begun to burst through the smoggy horizon's last light. And I snuck the gun into a plastic bag, hailed a taxi, and headed toward Central Park West. Let me end the suspense right now. Paul Cleary died last week from heart failure, so obviously my attempt on his life 15 years ago was not a success. And this isn't, isn't some sort of hard-boiled mystery murder story or last-minute confession. Addicts don't have the best judgment in the world, and if I had stopped for a moment to think about it, I would have realized that lots of people probably wanted to kill Paul Cleary, and plenty of such people had probably tried to do so at one point or another, and so his continued existence might, perhaps, suggest a certain amount of security around him. I walked into the vast lobby of the apartment building, a lobby that seemed lit with ivory, and immediately a guard sitting behind a marble desk said, Good evening, Mr. Trager. Go right up to the 40th floor. Mr. Cleary is expecting you. I'm in Italy. How do I know I'm in Italy? I, I don't know, but people seem to be talking Italian, and the landscape is kind of rolling hills dotted with groves of olive trees. 
I'm dressed in a 1930s type getup with a floppy hat and baggy pants, vest, and jacket. I'm part of a gang, and I have a gun, a silver plated rectangular looking thing. I'm with a bunch of other people, and we're on the run from a gang of other people. They all have guns, too. We're getting chased across the hills. We get cornered, and a gun battle starts, and people are running everywhere, and bullets are flying by, spiraling in their trajectories, and I can see them go as if they're slowed down, like in the Matrix. I'm the lousiest shot in Italy. I can't hit anyone, even people running straight at me. Then I do manage to take out one guy. I couldn't miss. I was about three feet away. He goes down, and then I get shot in the side. The bullet is stopped by my rib cage, half in the skin and half out. I pull it out with my fingers, and I see the bullet is made of wood, as if someone had carved it. Those of us who aren't killed run away and hide out in an old church. The place is really old, with lots of rooms. In one alcove in the wall, a young woman who had been shot dead has been laid out behind a glass door that lifts up and closes like on a bread box. When the glass is down, she's alive in there, and she taps on the glass and tries to tell me something, but when you lift the glass, she's dead, laid out with flowers in her hands. As I ponder this mystery, I become aware that our enemies have entered the church. I peer around the corner into another room, and I see the bad guys of one of our guys on the floor, and they're going to cut his balls off with a razor. Exit stage right. I sneak out the side door of the place and run like mad up and up a nearby hill. I sit there for a while, digging the quiet and the beauty of the natural surroundings. Then the bad guys are coming up the hill after me, and I get up and run down this curving path that leads into dark woods. The elevator was the size of the house I used to own in New Jersey. It asked what floor I wanted to go to. I told it the 40th, and within a second, the door is shut. Soft piano music came on, and the elevator began to rise. A couple of seconds later, the music faded out. The doors slid open. I had the pistol in my hand, and Paul Cleary stood in front of me, smiling. Don't bother, he said. You ruined my life, I said, and pulled the trigger. The bullet shot out the barrel, then slowed down, and it stopped in midair. Cleary plucked it from its stasis and chuckled. Another one for my collection, he said. I pulled the trigger again, 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 all ten shots in the pistol's magazine. Each bullet froze in the air, and then, as I stepped toward them, clattered to the ground. Would you like something to drink, Cleary said. An hour later, we were laughing together, having discovered a mutual love of Jack Daniels and ancient gangster movies. As we sat in the central living room of the apartment, white heat played on the wall, and we sipped real Jack in real glasses with real ice. So how'd you do it? I asked. What? The trick with the bullets. He smiled. It's just a little dream I gave you. A daydream, or a replaced moment. In reality, the guards took the gun from you when you came into the building. I thought the dream would amuse you and uh, help you feel less shame, I said, a little more loudly than I had intended. Well, yes, I suppose. Another drink. I gave him my glass, and he filled it at the bar on the other side of the room. This could all be a dream, I said. It could, but it's not. Depends on your definition of dream. He handed me my drink. We continued watching the movie. After a few minutes, Cleary lit a cigarette. I stared at him. Oh, he said, I I'm sorry, ter terrible manners. Do you smoke? No, I said. Thanks, though. One addiction's enough for me. Where'd you find real tobacco? Imported from Australia, actually. Imagine what Cagney would have said if you told him the Australians would eventually become the world's great and last tobacconists. Smoke drifted through the room and brushed against the gray images on the wall. Ever tried quitting, I asked? Cleary nodded. I quit every day, he said, his voice a little more than a whisper. It causes the most marvelous dreams.
It was after all the disasters happened that I got hooked on Cleary's dreams, just after all the predictions anybody had ever made about the next 20 years actually came true. Stock market crashes, genetic m mutation of crops and food, portable nuclear bombs set off in O'Hare Airport, oceans rising, martial law declared, personal ownership of firearms banned, evangelical Christianity proclaimed the national religion of the U.S. of A., famines and and plagues, and on, and on, and on. The accumulated weight of years of expectation finally burst the bonds of reality, and humanity was free to suffer through a species-wide anxiety attack. Three days later, those of us who hadn't chewed off our arms or been killed by a neighbor were left to figure out what had happened. A global psychic event, some pundit caused it, apparently unaware of the image the phrase conjured in so many minds of a convention of fat old ladies wearing chintzy turbans and peering into crystal balls. The official story had something to do with solar flares and microwave transmissions, but I've always suspected the truth was somebody got hold of a big stash of LSD and splashed it all over the country. The U.S. gross national product dipped to third world levels, the national debt rose higher than ever, and the Chinese didn't even try to hide their amusement at our plight. I didn't care about any of it, though, because the day before the disasters, I caught my wife in bed with my best friend. And the day after the disasters, I stepped outside and found their heads impaled on the iron fence enclosing the yard of our house. They could have been killed by the Jihad for Jesus or by rampaging environmental militants determined to lower population growth and bring back the whale. We were all fanatics in those days. I was some sort of fanatic myself, I'm sure, though I don't remember the details. I stared at the heads of the two people I loved most in the world, and I couldn't remember anything at all. I didn't go back to the house. The National Guard was looking for volunteers to help the cleanup efforts, and I joined, grateful to have something to belong to, some people around me, some tasks to occupy my attention. At night, we huddled together in the barracks and tried not to sleep, because sleep was too much like what had happened before. One night, after none of us had slept for more than an hour or two in the past week, a doctor came in and gave us injections, and that's when the dreams began. I'm living underground in this kind of warren of hard, dirt-packed rooms connected by miles and miles of dark tunnels. There are no lights in the tunnels, but there are candles in the rooms. A couple of other people, no one I knew, and I are in one of the rooms, and we're sitting around listening to a guy with a bandana around his neck play the accordion. We're eating the food of the tunnels, which turns out to be these perfectly cut, curved slices of only the skin of peppers and peaches. There's a girl there I'm interested in who kisses me before she leaves. Then I leave, and it's a long, long walk through the tunnels. Occasionally, if you make a wrong turn, you come out of the tunnels and wind up in an old attic with cast-off stuff, the detritus of guard sa garage sales, etc., I wonder why the tunnels have no lights, or why I haven't taken a lit candle with me. As I walk along, trying to find my own room, I notice the tunnels are getting smaller and smaller. Then some of us are outside, beneath an overcast sky, sitting on the rim of a shallow crater with a big lake in the bottom. My maternal grandfather is sitting next to me, his complexion ashen gray, and he's smoking a Chesterfield. Everybody is talking about a time when this kid stole a car, and the water in the crater froze, and he drove the car around crazy on the ice, beeping and fishtailing all over the place. I wasn't there when the thing actually happened, but as I sit there, I see it vividly in my imagination. The kid in the car is this kid that at one time had lived next door to me in Collingswood. Once, when he was playing with my older son, I overheard him say that he was made of metal. He then proceeded to run full tilt, head first, into the brick wall that was at the back of my house. It was that kid in the car in my memory, cross-eyed and screaming like mad. 
I asked my grandfather if he remembered the incident with the car and the ice, and he shook his head and said, No, that was back when he had the troubles. The troubles he was referring to, I just realized, was when he died after having 20 strokes in a row. He smiled, and then it was time to go back into the underground. I met with Cleary once a month or so to watch movies. The Big Sleep, Fear in the Night, Out of the Past. Lots of titles I've forgotten. I, I don't know where he got them. Most of the good movies had been destroyed during the disasters by roving bands of copyright lawyers. Cleary liked me because I didn't ask a lot of questions, didn't pry into his personal life, didn't criticize him. He knew I still wanted to kill him and that someday I might even have the courage and strength to do so, but companionship was more satisfying to me then than revenge ever could have been. The sweet moment when someone recognizes your face, a stronger draw than the daydream of one more death. As we spent more time together, my curiosity about him grew. It surprises me now, in fact, that I wasn't more curious about him from the beginning, given how, how much of his own life and desires had been coded into the dreams. But it took me a while to realize that the dreams were not some product he whipped up in a laboratory from arcane chemical formulas, but were, rather, a part of himself, a part he extracted, distilled, packaged but could never entirely disown. You had a family? I asked him one night. I did. And? They went away. Dead? No, he said. Just gone. Cigarette smoke clouded his face in a room lit only by the movie on the wall. I woke up one morning, and they just weren't here anymore. How long ago? Long enough. He asked me even fewer questions than I asked him, but as we began to see each other less and less, he finally asked me something I think he'd wanted to know for a while. Do you really think my dreams are to blame for what's happened to you? I wished at that moment that I was a smoker because I could have lit a cigarette and taken a long drag and blown the smoke into the air to create a satisfyingly dramatic pause. As it was, all I could do was look down at my battered shoes and sigh. No, I said, but I've got to blame something. I dreamed I was a writer and had a reading gig, and when I got to it, it turned out to be at the base of this pier. It was night and it was cold. The water lapped the sand behind me. Boards were nailed up across the stanchions of the pier, so I really couldn't see too well underneath it. A couple of them were falling off. I stood there and read a story. I think it was called The Beautiful Gelriche, whatever that means. All I could hear was the ocean behind me. Then from inside I heard applause and a voice told me to enter. When I looked up, there was a hole in the boards that I could just about squeeze through. Inside was a very dimly lit, classy-looking bar. The only light in the place came from behind the bar where they kept the booze. There were five beautiful women in evening gowns, and they greeted me in southern accents. They were really interested in what I had to say, and were hanging on my every word, this is where I should have known it was a dream. Anyway, they wanted to dance, so I, I danced with a couple of them. Kind of a stately waltz-type dancing. And then we got drinks and moved into this other dark room where we sat on a long purple couch. I was trying to talk to them, but one of them had a pet goat. And the goat kept trying to get up on the couch and get me off of the couch. So I start wrestling with this goat. And the next thing I know, I'm out on the street walking, and it's daytime. I run, in, run into this guy who looks like a short magnum P.I. He gets in my face about something. I yell back at him, and then a fight ensues. Surprisingly, I am much stronger than the guy, and I'm really kicking the shit out of him. But he's like rubber. You can't hurt him. You can only stun him. So I, I knock him down and run. 
I go to a deli with tables and chairs and sit down and order lunch. Before long, Magnum shows up and he's murderous mad. He lunges through the doorway and we fight and I pound the crap out of him, but then he bounces back up. I slam his head into the wall to no avail. There's just no stopping him. He's one, one resilient motherfucker. Finally, I give him the slip and I wind up at work teaching writing at the grade school I went to when I was a kid. My office is a square of dirt and a line of squares of dirt out on the playground. When I arrive, I have a student waiting for me. Before I get to my square of dirt, I run into an old friend of mine who also went to school there, and he's teaching there too. I ask him if at lunchtime he wants to play basketball or go down to the woods and smoke a joint. He laughs as if the answer is obvious. I go and check out the student waiting for me, and she's poking a hole in the ground in my office square with a stick. As I approach, she says, There is bees in there. I tell her not to poke it because they'll swarm, and sure enough, I tell her to run or they'll sting us to death. We start running, and I look over my shoulder, and good God, there's a swarm of bees, like one of those sandstorms from the movie The Mummy. I think to myself, I wonder what it would be like to get stung by all those bees. The first week it was heaven. We hurried through the days of cleaning up broken houses, clearing streets, hauling corpses, and dredging rivers, just so we could run back to the barracks and get the injection and sleep. It was escape, a way to think about something other than what had happened to us or could happen to us. It was somebody else's life and memories refracted through somebody else's dream. By the second week, we all suspected we were hooked, but nobody would say anything. By the third and fourth weeks, a couple people tried to sleep without the injections and woke up screaming in the night, woke up with their eyes bulging out and all the veins in their foreheads pulsing because they couldn't stop screaming and they didn't know why. Within a few months, we could barely work. The days grew so suffused with longing for night that each of us lost the ability to speak. We rarely ate. Our arms and legs shook. The tips of our fingers were raw from the nails being bitten away, and we ground our teeth until our jaw muscles spasmed. My eyes dried out. My skin burned. The roots of my hair began to ache so much that I shaved my head three and four times a day, sometimes ferociously enough to provoke blood. One day I took a long screw from one of our toolboxes and began to drive it into my forehead with my hand. I got it in pretty far before I collapsed. The infirmary was crowded with raving, ravaged dreamers. The building had been a warehouse once, and now it housed row after row of cots, each cot occupied by a body, each body strapped down by the arms and legs. Hundreds of naked light bulbs hung from long cords and that stretched up toward the shadows of the ceiling. When I first woke, it was from a dream, a dream of my own, and I woke screaming, the wound in my forehead throbbing. I pulled against the leather straps, but I couldn't raise my arms to wipe away the ants that crawled between each bead of sweat on my face. My mouth was filled with ash, my lips burned, and still I screamed, but my screams were hollow and thin amidst all the other screams in the giant room. That's Quitting Dreams. Thank you.